I'll try to stay close to this mic tonight because I forgot all about that. Uh, I was too full. I've eaten two good meals today and I was really full. So I'll try to stay right here because there's two reasons. I don't want to get away from this mic. And secondly, I am so full I have an anchor tonight just holding me right here. We've had such a good time today. We were at Russ and, and Martha's earlier today and, and it was just a wonderful time. And I remembered, I remembered that uh, the first time that I came up here, which was about 35 years ago or so, uh, that I came up here, it was just me. And I was over at Russ's place and he was showing me his cows. I had on a brand new suit. I had just bought a suit to come up here and impress all of you. And, uh, and I had this new suit on, and we were walking around behind the cows who were all up to be milked and everything, and we had just passed this one cow when it shot a calf out. It was standing up, and the calf just went out and hit the ground with its head on the cement, and, uh, and it wasn't moving. And Russ said, we've got to get this cow breathing. And so I'm in my suit, and I just... That is a messy thing when it comes out. I just got to tell you. And we're just pumping his legs and moving him around. And he wasn't going to breathe. And then he finally let the mother go. And she had that calf up in just almost no time. It was amazing what a mama can do that a preacher in a new suit can't do. But I was, uh, I remember I just took something and tried to wipe all that stuff off my pants because I had to come out and preach after that. Uh, but I don't know if y'all knew that. But those, that's one of my memories. And that same trip, another memory that I think I will have for the rest of my life, we had gone over, we were staying with, with Gary and with Bev, and uh, the boys wanted to show me the feeder pigs. And this, we had just gotten there, and they wanted to show me the feeder pigs. And so they went out, and, and uh, Donnie's out there, and he's picking up pigs. He's just uh, picking up a whole lot of pigs and showing me the finer points of a pig, which I didn't know anything about. And, and then he goes by, and he pats the old sow, and, and then they had a horse. He pats on the horse for a little while. And about that time, Bev calls us up for dinner. And so we walk from the barn, and we're headed back to the house, get to the back porch, and, and there's a cat on the back porch. And Donnie picks up the cat, and he says, now, why did I do that? Now I have to wash my hands. <laughs> I thought, oh, okay, all right. Well, anyway, I'll never forget that. Those are, you know, the pigs were okay, but the cat, oh. Uh, you know, that was, Amen. but I, yeah, there you go. There you go. But I'll never forget those moments. I have a lot of good memories from here, and I'm building a lot more this week, and I'm, I'm so thankful for all of you. Thank you for everything you've done to make us feel welcome. I want to take you over to Hebrews chapter 5. If you start at verse 12, he's talking to Christians there and he says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need that someone teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and and evil. Tonight, I want to talk to you about discerning good and evil and, and what the Bible says about how we determine and, and discern good and evil. Now, before I get started, let me just tell you that when you go to the New Testament, there is a word for good and there is a word for evil. The word for good is kalos. The word for evil is kakos. Those two words are interesting because they don't mean primarily righteousness and wickedness. When God says that we discern between good and evil, good is not necessarily what he means when he uses the word righteous. And evil doesn't mean wicked. That's not its primary meaning. Kalos means beneficial, helpful, beautiful, and gracious. That's what it means. And so when a person is good, and so you have Barnabas called a good man, what that means is that he was a beneficial, helpful person. That's what he did. He's a good man. When you use the word kakos, which is evil, it means that which hurts, that damages, things that are injurious. That's the idea of evil. Now, the reason that wickedness is evil is because wickedness hurts you. And the reason that righteousness is good is because righteousness helps you. So when you discern between good and evil, and by the way, it's exactly the same thing in the Old Testament where the one word for good is tob, and it means that which is helpful. And the word for evil is ra, and it means that which hurts. And so you read in the Old Testament, there are times that God visited evil on sinful people. 
Did God send to sinful people? No, he, he visited pain on sinful people. That's the idea behind it. So when we discern good and evil, I want us to discern surely what is righteous and not righteous. But the other thing that I want you to do is, because when we're looking at this tonight, and how do you determine what is good? How do you determine what is evil? I want you to know that there are some things that may be morally neutral that still may be evil. There may be some things that are morally neutral that still may be good, helpful things. And so how do I decide how that is? We make all kinds of decisions in our lives. You're called upon every year to make some major decisions in your life. And it might be, what will I do for a job? It may be, what kind of car will I buy? Should we move to another neighborhood? Uh, what school should we put our children in? Should we homeschool or should we public school? What are we going to do? All those are kind of decisions that we make. How do I know what the will of God is in those questions? How can I determine what the will of God is in those questions? And, and, and before I get into telling you how to discern whether it's the will of God or not, or how to better discover whether it's the will of God or not, how about just let me tell you that so many of the decisions that people make, even Christian people make, turn out wrong. I see it all the time. Here's a guy who's been working for the same company for 20 years and he's kind of bored. And he thinks, I'm going to go and work somewhere else because I'm really bored with this. And I think that God may be leading me to a different job. And so he takes a different job and he's miserable in that job. He hates the job that he has. He leaves that and never works more than three years at any place for the rest of his life. And the decision was wrong. I've watched people who were very happy with their neighbors in their neighborhood, but their income seems to be that they should live in a nicer neighborhood. They can afford it, and they should live in a nicer neighborhood with a bigger house and have a nicer car. And so they make a decision that this is what we're going to do. And it turns out their kids don't like the school. They don't have the closeness of neighbors. They're strapped with a bill for their house that they can hardly afford, and they're miserable in their life. They made a decision but they made the wrong decision. Even though they were Christians, they made the wrong decision. So many of the decisions that we make turn out wrong. It's better not to make a bad decision. And I wanna know how I can keep that uh, from the other. And, and, and by the way, along that line, I wanna just say this before we get to discerning the will of God. If you are not happy where you are, you will not be happy where you're going. Can I make that? Because you're gonna be taking you with you. I have people every once in a while that will say, look, uh, I, I want to place membership at Creve Hall. And I say, well, why do you want to do this? Because people aren't very nice to me where I am. The, the folks aren't very good. We've got all kinds of problems at the congregation where I'm, so I want to come to Creve Hall. <laughs> I said, if you aren't happy over there, you're probably not going to be happy over here. We have lots of problems over here, too. You know why we have problems? Because we're people. And by the way, if you're looking for a perfect congregation, if you ever find one, please don't go. You're going to mess it up because we're not perfect. That's just the way it is. OK, so I want us to be able to make that count the cost of making a wrong decision before you make a right decision and know that given enough information and enough time going to the right sources, you probably can make decisions that are within the will of God. How do I come to understand what the will of God is in my life. Well, let me give you seven things. You want to write these down. I hope you'll write these down. Seven ways of figuring out whether a thing is good, whether this is the will of God for me to do this. And, and when I say that, I want to tell you that there are some things that are absolutely you can know. And so I, I, want to, I want to give you the things first that you can know. Obviously, when you're trying to decide if a thing is good, the number one place you need to go is the Bible. OK, number one above everything else is the Bible. The Bible is filled with precepts and principles. OK, there is a thou shalt and a thou shalt not for a whole lot of things. When you see a thou shalt, then do it. If you see a thou shalt not, don't. OK, I don't have to wonder whether I should hide my income from the IRS. You know why? Because the Bible says don't lie. I already know what that one is. And so when the Bible gives you a specific do this or don't do that, you know what the will of God is. I see too many people that are wringing their hands saying, I just don't know what to do. When they know exactly what to do, they just don't have the courage to do the right thing. They're looking for a way to do the wrong thing. And I would just tell you, go to the Bible first above everything else. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, learn not to go beyond what is written. Okay, so first of all, I want to find out if the Bible has something to say about this. And while it may not always have a specific command about this thing, I will tell you that it will always have a principle. 
there are three different levels that you need to get to in order to understand the Bible. The first of those is the precept level, okay? And you write that down, okay? You want to know what the precepts of Scripture are. That means what the Bible says to do and what the Bible says not to do. I need to study the Bible to the point that I understand the precepts. But if I study the Bible and that's all I get, it says this is what I'm supposed to do and this is what I'm not supposed to do, I'm going to miss what the Bible is really about. Yes, that's true, but that's not where God wants you to stop. You keep reading those principles and precepts until you begin, or, or precepts until you begin to understand the principles behind it. These are not the specific commands of thou shalt or thou shalt not. It means that God has a reason for the things that he said. And if you read long enough, you begin to understand there are principles under, underlying those commands that he gave. I want to understand what those principles are. And that means I need to spend a lot of time understanding the scripture. But if I understand the precepts and I understand the principles, I'm still not where God wants me to be. What God gave me these precepts and God gave me these principles is for something a lot more. He wants me to understand his person. You go from precept to principle to person. Do you remember John chapter 5, I believe it is, verse 39, where Jesus said to the Pharisees, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they that testify of me. And you will not come to me that you might have life. You study the scriptures long enough till you see God in them. That's what you do because God wants you to understand him. And so I want to go to the scriptures first. The things that were written beforehand were written for our learning. Romans chapter 15 verse 4. That we through the patience and comfort of scripture might have hope. I want to go to the scripture first. That's number one. I've spent way too much time on that point. Okay, here's number two. How do I know what am I going to do beyond Scripture? I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray. Listen to James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally and does not upbraid, and it will be given him. Somebody says, well, you know, that's a general principle. No, that's just a truth, okay? If you ask God for wisdom... He will give it. And the only proviso that he has about that is this next thought. Listen. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave driven by the, uh, a wave driven in the sea, driven by the wind and tossed. Let not that man think he'll receive anything of the Lord. He's a double-minded man and unstable in all his ways. He says, if you ask believing, I'll give it. If you ask me for wisdom, I will give it just as much as he who believes and is baptized shall be saved and I'll do it. He said, I'll do this. Ask me for wisdom, okay? Now somebody says, but I, I know myself too well and I have all these doubts. Well, yeah, there's a name for people who never doubt themselves. Insanity, that's the name. Only insane people don't doubt themselves. If you know yourself at all, you know that you're not smart enough. If you know yourself at all, you know that you sometimes even let yourself down. We fail all the time. And anybody who has any kind of self-knowledge realizes I can't trust myself in every area. I know I can't. Uh, that's just the way we are. So if I had to pray without any doubts in my life at all about me or anything else, I'd never get an answer to anything. But that's not what he's talking about. I don't have any doubts about who he is. He's God. He's omnipotent. He's all-knowing. No, he's, all he's omniscient. There's nowhere I can be that he isn't. And God, who knows everything and has the power to make everything come about and who loves me more than I can possibly imagine, said, ask me. Trust me, I'll give you wisdom. I was at a, at a different place in a different state at one point when a lady came forward at the end of the service and asked the preacher to help. She said, I'm at wit's end. My daughter died last year. She was my only child. I'm a widow. And I, I, I'm at a loss. I can't figure out what to do. I don't know what to do next. And the preacher who got up to give that statement to the congregation told her, and, and had a prayer, said, Lord, give her a sign. Give her a sign of what she's supposed to do. Can I tell you something? An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. And how do you know what sign it is, okay? Have you ever done this? I, you probably don't do it too much here in Spencer because there's not enough traffic lights to do it. But have you ever done this? Lord, I, I don't know what to do, so if the next 10 traffic lights in a row are green, I'll know that's your will. That's what you want me to do. And you get 10 traffic lights in a row are green, you still have to say, was that luck or was that an answer? I'm not really sure. 
I don't know if that was really true. And if you're looking for signs, you will drive yourself crazy. Quit looking for signs as to whether something is right or wrong to do. Ask for wisdom, and it becomes a lot clearer. Always ask for wisdom. Here's the third thing that I would tell you to do besides pray. Check your conscience. Check your conscience. In Romans chapter 14, remember that Paul is talking about some people eat meat and some people eat only vegetables. Some people celebrate one day above another and some people see all the days at the same. And he said, just don't judge each other about that. But he said this, which I find very interesting. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he doesn't eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith is sin. If you read it in context, he's not talking about whatever is not revealed in Scripture. He's talking about whatever you can't do in good conscience is sin to you. Even if it's morally neutral, if your conscience tells you not to do it and you do it, you're sinning. Anytime you violate your own conscience, you sin. Check your conscience. When it comes to a decision you're trying to make, can I make this in good conscience? Now, if you can, that doesn't mean you should do it. But if you can't do it in good conscience, it means don't, don't, don't. Never violate your conscience. Conscience is a wonderful red light. It is an absolutely lousy green light. Do you remember what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4? I know nothing against myself, but I'm not justified by this. He who judges me is the Lord. He says, I'm doing everything in good conscience. It doesn't mean I'm okay. God's the one who knows whether I'm okay or not. I cannot go just by the fact that I feel like this is okay. Remember Paul when he stood before the Sanhedrin and said, Better than I've lived before God in all good conscience until this day? He was killing Christians when he was doing that. He wasn't right, but he didn't have a bad conscience. Okay? The point of this is, and it's really an important point, if your conscience says, I can't do this in good faith, don't do it, even if somebody else thinks it's just fine. Don't do it. Check your conscience. Here's one that we don't talk about as often. I want you to go with me to Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. This is the fourth thing that I need to always check in with if I'm determining if this is the will of God. Therefore, my beloved brethren, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And this is the part I want you to notice carefully. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Sometimes that dream that is so big it scares you to death. Sometimes that, that desire to do something that you just think, man, how in the world would I ever do that? Sometimes that desire comes straight from God. At times, God works in the hearts of people who want to serve him and plants a dream in their heart a desire in their heart that's coming straight from him. Not every desire you have obviously comes straight from him. Be careful for your evil desires. You know, if, if you have a desire for somebody who's not your wife, <laughs> listen, that's not a desire that came from God and you know it. But sometimes those great, noble, scary dreams, they came straight from God. It's God who works in us both to will and to do. So here's the fourth thing I want you to check. Do you have a strong desire? Okay, if... if if you don't have a strong desire, it's probably not the will of God. But where is your desire? I, I see people who sometimes are asked if they would serve as an elder. And, and because they have all of these outside qualifications, uh, it looks like they would make really good elders. But when you talk to them, they say, I have no desire to be an elder. And I ask them further questions on that, by the way. If, if you mean, do you have any desire to hold an office in the church? If that's your desire to hold an office in the church, you're probably not qualified. Because it's not about an office, it's about a work. But if you have a desire to help young Christians grow, if you have a desire to help people resolve their differences, if you have a desire to strengthen the weak, if you have a desire to, to feed the faithful, oh man, follow that desire. Because that's the desire you're looking for. Do you have a desire in you? And, and that's, so check what you want to do. If you don't want to do it, probably it's not, not the good thing to do, okay? Here's number five. And this one is so obvious that I think anybody ought to get it, but a lot of people don't. There's a passage in Acts chapter 17 that kind of illustrates what I'm talking about. Look at verse 26. Acts chapter 17, verse 26. 
He has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. God has limited mankind. We talk about the unlimited human potential, and I, and I get what we mean by that, but in fact, we're not unlimited. We are limited by a lot of different things. Uh, some people are born black. Some people are born white. Some people are born Asian. Some people are born into rich families. Some people are born into poor families. Some people are born in single-parent families. Some are born to parents who love each other, and they can't do anything about that. All I'm telling you is, you don't get a choice in that. You don't get a choice whether you were born in America or born in Ecuador. I'm telling you, the fact of the matter is, you didn't get a choice in that. You, there are certain limits. And so what I would tell you in the fifth place is, check your circumstances, okay? If you want to buy a $300,000 house, and the company says you're only qualified to buy a $100,000 house, you already know what your answer is. Am I making sense here? If you buy a $300,000 house when you can't afford it, you have missed the will of God. I'm just telling you, you look for your circumstances. What are your circumstances in life? God's will is sometimes very clearly revealed in the circumstances in which we live. Here's number six, okay? Number six. It's found in Proverbs 15.22. Proverbs 15.22. Without counsel... Plans go awry, but in the multitude of counselors, they are established. If you want to know the will of God, get some counsel. And, and what do I mean by counsel? You need to get somebody that you can talk to that will give you counsel in that. Now, I have two provisos for when you get counsel. Okay? One of them is make sure that person loves God at least as much as you do. Make sure that when you're getting counsel, you don't get counsel from somebody who doesn't love God. If you are having problems and you go to a psychiatrist who is a secular psychiatrist, they're going to tell you things that God says absolutely don't do. Okay? There are lots and lots of folks out there who will give you counsel. Uh, if you go to the people that you work with and say, you know, I'm not really happy with my wife, but this girl over here just really, some of them are going to say, hey, you just want you to be happy. You just need to do that. It's okay. Uh, there are all kinds of people who will encourage you to do wrong things. So number one, make sure they love God as much as you do. Secondly, Make sure they have expertise in the area you're trying to get counsel. This is really important. If you need financial counseling, please, please, please do not come to me because I'm not the guy. I, I'm not that guy. Uh, you know, I have spent a lot of my life having more month than money. I just, I don't, I'm not the guy you need to talk to for financial counseling. That wouldn't be me. If you want to talk about the scripture and some spiritual issues, I'm glad to talk to you and I can help you with that. But, I, but go, if it's a question you have, go to somebody who has some expertise and experience in that. So get counsel from somebody who loves God as much as you do at least and who has expertise in the area where you need counsel, okay? Uh, but when there's a multitude of counselors, plans are established. That's what he says. If you want to know the will of God... You're going to have to ask some people, get out beyond just what you want to do and ask some people. And here's one that, again, we don't talk about very much. And that's uh, found in a several passages, but let me just go to a few. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33. God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. When you have checked the scriptures, when you have prayed for wisdom... When you have done all the things that we've talked about so far, the next thing you need to ask yourself is, do I have any peace about this decision? And if you have no peace, don't make that decision today. Okay? Do you have any peace about what you're doing? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. This one even makes it clearer. Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. Listen. <laughs> Let the peace of God... Rule in your hearts to which you were called in one body and be thankful. Do you know what that word rule means there in the scripture? Look it up if you have a Greek dictionary and the first dictionary definition is going to be to serve as an umpire. It says, let peace decide or arbitrate in your heart. If you have no peace with the decision, even though you've looked at everything else and there's no peace, don't do that yet. Don't do that yet. Get to a point where in your heart of hearts you have peace with it. It doesn't mean you're not scared, because sometimes you're going to be scared to death. But have some peace about it. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. And then remember 2 Thessalonians 3, it's in verse 16. May the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. 
If you can follow those seven things, you can be pretty sure of what the will of God is in your life. And so those are the seven areas that I would tell you to determine whether a thing is good, beneficial, helpful, and according to the will of God, you need to check all seven of those things. Well, in contrast to that, how do I know whether a thing is, is evil? And, and uh, how do I discern what is evil? After all, those who by reason of use can do it, how do I do it? Well, let me give you seven things really quick. Seven questions you need to ask yourself before when you are trying to decide if a thing is evil. First of all, is it wrong in itself? This is the same basic idea of going back to the Bible. Uh, how do I know whether it's wrong in itself? There are three passages of scripture that give you a list of things that are clearly wrong. Three passages of scripture that you need to check all the time, okay? Here, let me just read them to you. Galatians 5, 19 through 21, the works of the flesh. The works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those things are evil. Those things are hurtful. You know that. You don't even have to ask yourself that. If you're a person who tends to blow up on other people and say, well, it's just the way I am. I just have this temper, and I, I blow up quickly, but I get over it. So does a shotgun, and it leaves a whole lot of damage in front of it. I'm telling you, you need to change that, because that's evil. That's what the Bible says. You need to control that, because it's an evil thing. Here's one very similar. It's found in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 3 through 6. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 3 through 6. Fornication and all uncleanness or covetous not, not even be named among you as is fitting for saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting. If you like a dirty joke, he says, that's wrong, okay? Which are not fitting, but, are, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance of the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these, the wrath of God comes on the sons of disobedience. He says, these are wrong, and they're never right. These are always wrong. One more passage. Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 9. Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 9. Therefore, put to death your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming on the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves also once walked when you lived in them, but now you yourselves put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you put off the old man with his deeds including lying, all those things. And by the way, do you know the number one thing that husbands lie to their wives about? Do you know what that is? This is interesting to me. The number one thing that husbands lie to their wives about is money, n not anything else. But that they lie about. Uh, the, the wife says, did you pay the electric bill? What do you think I am, irresponsible? Yeah, of course I paid the electric bill. I just sent it out yesterday. I, I took care of that, and then you go out and you pay the electric bill. You know, I didn't want her to worry. No, you just lied. Okay, don't lie. Don't lie about anything. Don't lie. Uh, when, when a lady comes up to you and says, how do you like my dress? And what are you going to say when you think, oh, man, oh, man, what taste does she have? Uh, I generally respond to that. All my taste is in my mouth. How do I know? But uh, I, I remember when uh, I had a husband say, my wife says, does this dress make me look fat? And I just hope that I can have a heart attack before she says it so she'll forget the question. Uh, you know, but tell the truth. You don't have to be brutal, but, but tell the truth. And when it comes to those things, by the way, it's a matter of taste, and your taste is probably not so good, so don't worry about that. But always tell the truth. And then even though you don't lie for policy's sake or anything else, when people need the truth from you, they know where they can come. They always know they can come to you. Don't lie. Okay, here's the second question I need to ask myself. Does it harm me spiritually? Does whatever I'm doing or thinking about doing harm me spiritually? Will it cause me to become less interested in worship? Will it cause me to be less interested in Bible study? Will it cause me to be less interested in prayer or in Christian service? There are a lot of things that aren't wrong in themselves. 
I remember there was, a, there was a young couple that had been missing services for a long time when I was living in Alabama, and I went to their house, and I'm talking to them, and I said, you know, we really missed you, but I haven't seen you in weeks at, at the services. And they said, well, you know, here's the thing. They said, we are on four different softball teams and three different bowling teams. And he said, the only day we can get any rest is Sunday, so we just rest up on Sunday, and that's the reason we haven't been going. Well, nothing wrong with softball, nothing wrong with bowling. When they get in the way of spiritual things, they're damaging to you, okay? So don't worry saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear, for after all these things the Gentiles seek, your Heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But look into verse 33 of Matthew chapter 6. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. What's first in your life? Are you giving to the Lord out of what you have left over, or do you set aside for the Lord first and then give to everybody else what you have left over? Uh, what is it that we're doing? Do I put worship and serving God above everything else? Do I really put my job above everything else? And then if I have time, I'll get there. I, I can't tell you how many parents I know who said academics are very important. And so their kids don't show up on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights. And the reason they don't show up, they have homework to do. And so we tell them, why are you telling your kids that homework is more important than being with God's people and worshiping? You, what are you putting first in your life? This is really important. It may not be bad, but it can hurt you spiritually. Listen, see then you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, buying up the time, he says, because the days are evil. That's Ephesians 5, 15 and 16. Here's another one that I really like. It's Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. <laughs> Therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. He said there's two things you've got to avoid. One is the weights that are slowing you down, and the second is the sin that ensnares you. Some things aren't sin, but they sure keep you from doing the right thing. If what you're involved in is keeping you from doing the most important things in your life, then you need to rethink what you're doing. And I would say this to dads too. If your work keeps you so busy you don't have time for your kids, it's keeping you from doing something far more important than your work. Okay? Everybody has to think that way. Everybody has to consider themselves that way. So is it, is it hindering my spiritual life? Here's number three, third question. And I've already talked about this on the positive side, but the other is, does it hurt my conscience? Okay, does it hurt my conscience? If it does, don't do it. Whatever is not of faith is sin. We looked at it a few moments ago, and I probably don't have to say anything more about that. If, it's, if it hurts your conscience, stop it. Stop it. Uh, number four, does it harm me physically? Okay, is this activity something that harms me physically? Remember 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20? Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit that you have from God, and you're not your own, you were bought with a price? Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We are the temple of God. The church is the temple of God, if you look at chapter 3, verse 16. But individually, we are the temple of God. God lives in us. So don't do anything that's going to cause harm to your body. And I know some things will harm you, you didn't mean to do it, and they do, but there are certain things you know are going to be harmful to you. I only have so many brain cells, I can't afford to drown too many of them in alcohol. That would be bad for me. I, I need every one I've got. Okay? Drugs are going to hurt you. Smoking is going to hurt you. A lot of things in your life are going to hurt you. And you know that they're harmful. Quit doing them. That's the point of this. If, if it hurts you physically, stop doing it. Here's number five, fifth question. Does it hurt my influence for Christ? In other words, it may not just be something bad, but if it gets in the way of my influence for Christ, do I need to do it? Colossians chapter 4, verse 5 says, Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. And that's, that's what he tells you. Walk in wisdom toward people who are outside the church. There are some things that people are looking for in you. If you say you're a Christian, they would like for you to live like it. Okay, that doesn't mean that they expect you to be a stuffed shirt. And it certainly doesn't mean going to work and beating people over the head with the Bible every day. That's not going to do you much good. But they do expect you to live honestly. They do expect you to be an honorable person. They do expect you to have faith. They do expect you to have hope when they don't. Am I living in such a way that they're coming to know that? 
I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is a reasonable service. And don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove or show what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I want to live in such a way that it does that. You're the salt of the earth. If the salt has lost its flavor, how will it be seasoned? It's thenceforth good for nothing. If I'm not changing the world for the better, I'm actually hurting the influence of Christ on earth. So my question really is, does it hurt my influence for Christ? There are some things that I'm not going to do. There are some things that I don't believe are wrong in themselves or in a vacuum. But I think they're wrong if they keep somebody from coming to the Lord. That would make it wrong. Listen to this. Romans chapter 14, verse 13, and then verse 19. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. I don't want to hurt anybody and cause them to fall. Even if in the early church somebody says, can I eat meat or can I not eat meat? Paul says, meat's just meat. That's the way it is. And, and in the marketplace, you're not going to know if it was offered to an idol or not. If you can eat it in good conscience, then it's just meat. It's okay to eat. But here's the problem. You have some people who, eat, who get it from the marketplace, see you eat it, and they believe that it was offered to an idol, and they have the consciousness of the idol. They see you eat, and then they eat it. You've just caused your brother to sin. He said, don't do that. It was your liberty. But your liberty is not as important as your brethren's soul. And he said, so make sure that you live in such a way that you don't trip them up. That would be the important thing. Don't trip them up. And then verse 19, let us pursue the things which make for peace, and whereby one may edify another. Beware, lest somehow this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to those who are weak. 1 Corinthians 8, 9. When you sin against brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. That's verse 12 of 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Uh, so he says, encourage one another, exhort one another day by day while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. That's Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 to 14. So I ask yourself, am I helping or hurting my influence for Christ? Here's number six. I, I, I really am getting to the end. I promise you guys. Does it put me in the wrong crowd? If you're in an activity where you always find yourself with the wrong group, it might be a clue that you're in the wrong group doing the wrong thing. If you find yourself doing, listen to Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20. He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. Are you around wise people or fools? How are you, how are you spending your time? Uh, is, it, is it putting me in the wrong place? Uh, how about this one? In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, do not be deceived. Evil companions corrupt good morals. You know that that's true. My very first gospel meeting, I'll never forget it. It was in a place called Skyline, Alabama, up on the top of a mountain in the middle of nowhere. And my dad had called me up and said, can you take this meeting for me? I'm doing the second half of a meeting and I have kidney stones and I had just been preaching a short time. I said, I don't even have a meeting sermon. I don't know any. So you'll be fine. I've already told them you're coming, and they think you're going to be great. Well, I showed up there, and, and uh, the first thing that got me was, I don't know how many of you all know who Gus Nichols is, but he was one of the greatest scholars, I think, that the Brotherhood has ever produced. And I got up that night to preach, and they were introducing me, and they said, Brother Gus Nichols did a wonderful job Sunday through Tuesday. And I know that Brother Watkins is, and I thought, oh, no. I don't know enough to fill a thimble. And, and this is the greatest scholar that I've ever known who's spoken all earlier in this week, and I've got to do something. So I, I preached my sermon, and I felt like, well, I just, at least I got through it. I, I feel pretty good. I started to sit down, and the preacher said, oh, keep standing up there, Brother Watkins, because we're going to do what Brother Nichols did every night. Anybody here who has any questions, then he'll answer them, give you a biblical answer for every one of them. And I thought, oh, no, no. Their first question was, what's wrong with dispensational premillennialism? <laughs> I had never even heard of it. I had no idea what was wrong with it. I didn't know what they were talking about. And I said, that is a really good question we're going to discuss next, tomorrow night. <laughs> I thought, oh, boy, I better go home and find out what that is. But, and so I, I kind of put them off to the next night. And the second question was, is it a sin to roller skate? 
and, and, and I thought, well, that's the dumbest question I've ever heard. Is it a sin to roller skate? And I said, well, of course it's not a sin to roller skate. It's pretty good activity. We used to do it all the time in the youth group. We had a monthly skating party where my dad and everybody else participated. It was wonderful fellowship, and we had a great time. And you can see them just kind of flaming in the audience. You can see people getting angry in the audience. And I thought, okay, what, what did I just say? And, but I went ahead and I finished out, and they didn't ask me any more questions that night. But the next night, when it came time to asking the question, I said, the first thing I want to do is talk about dispensational premillennialism. I had spent all night and all the next day studying so I could give them the basic points of, of, of dispensational premillennialism and what was wrong. And I really laid it out, and I thought, man, I've, I've answered that question. I did a great job. Nobody paid a bit of attention. I said, now, what are your questions? Is it a cinder roller skate? And I thought, okay, I probably didn't answer that the best way last night, so let me give you a better answer. And I went through it all again and all again and uh, thought I had it answered just right. No more questions. Finished on Friday night, and they said, they said time for question and answers. Is it a cinder roller skate? And I thought, oh, no. And, and so I looked at the preacher. I said, have I not answered this twice already? I said, is there something I'm not getting in this? He said, well... Brother Nichols said that you can dance on your shoes or you can dance on wheels, but it's dancing either way and it's a sin. I thought, oh no, I've just been pitted against Brother, Brother Nichols. And I thought, that's, that's bad, but I still think Brother Nichols is wrong. I, I don't think he's right on this, but, but I didn't want to tell them I don't think Brother Nichols is right. But I said, is there some other reason? And he said, well, yeah, actually there is. He said, we have a skating rink that's just down the road from us. And he said, the worst kind of people hang out there. There's people being knifed there every week, and it's a terrible thing, and our kids want to go, but it's, uh, it's a terrible environment for them to be in. I said, oh, I wish you would have asked me that up front. You know, evil companions corrupt good morals. Of course, you don't go where you have that kind of environment, but there's nothing wrong with skating. There's something wrong with being in that kind of environment. Well, they still thought I was a heretic, but anyway, <laughs> my, my point is, if, if it puts you in the wrong company, don't do it. Remember 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14? Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness, or what fellowship has right with dark, light with darkness? Don't do something that is constantly putting you in the association of people who are going to bring you down. I want to tell you that if one of you were to stand on one of these pews and try to pick me up on that pew, you'd have a real hard time doing it. But if I'm standing on the ground, I can pull you off that pew without any effort really at all. I can make sure you don't stay on that pew. It's just a whole lot easier to pull people down than it is to pick people up. Make sure, make sure of the kind of environment that you're in. Here's the seventh question. Would Jesus do it? Would Jesus do it? Uh, if you know a person pretty well, you can generally figure out what they would do in a particular circumstance. And the more you read about the life of Jesus, the more you get a feel for what Jesus would do. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He's the way. John chapter 14, verse 6. Or how about this one? 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. I want to live like Jesus. Do I really think that if Jesus lived... Now, I'm not saying I want to wear a toga. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about dressing like Jesus dressed. But if Jesus lived in this year, 2018, how do you think he would dress? I can tell you that he wouldn't be walking around in sandals and a toga. If Jesus were here today, that's not the way he would dress. He looked like everybody else. There wasn't anything particularly about him physically that made him stand out. The Bible's very clear about that. He would dress like we do. He would look like we do. But there are some things I'm sure Jesus wouldn't do. There are some things I'm absolutely certain that Jesus wouldn't do in, in, in our time. If I know that Jesus wouldn't do it, I don't want to do it. Am I making sense here? Okay, those are the seven questions to ask to find out if a thing is detrimental or evil. And the other are the seven ideas or principles, things that I need to check with, the sources of information as to determine whether or not it's good or the will of God. If I get those things together, if I live by those 14 ideas, I'm going to tell you that my life is going to be lined up pretty evenly with where God wants me to be. And it's also going to keep me from making rash decisions that get me in all kinds of trouble. Uh, 
I want to be able to discern good from evil. Well, this has kind of been a lecture. It hasn't been a sermon. It's just been a lecture. But I want to know, first of all, has it been helpful to you? Okay, is it helpful? I hope it's helpful. Uh, I want it to be helpful to you. I don't want to, I, I, I thought I could do this any number of ways, but the thing that has helped me most in life is to kind of figure a process by which I can determine whether I should or should not do a thing. Um, there are all kinds of things that you can do. I, I think when you have a decision to make, okay, how about writing that decision out in, in, with your own handwriting, write it out on a piece of paper, this is the decision I'm trying to make. And then make a list below that, why am I wanting to make this decision? Make a list of the reasons why you feel like you need to make that decision. Make that list out. On another sheet of paper, make a list of if my motivation is right and the reasons that I want to make the decision, what are the possible pros of that decision? What are the possible cons of that decision? And after I've employed all the means of guidance that God has given me, and I still can't make a decision on that, then I need to wait. I need to wait. Anytime that a car salesman tells me, I have a deal for you, but it's only good for the next hour. I always tell them, you just made my mind up for me. The answer is no. I will not be rushed into this decision, whatever it is. And he says, oh, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. I said, okay, good. Then I've got longer than an hour. I'll think about it then. But any time that anybody tries to push you into a decision right this minute and you don't have any peace about it and you can't come to a decision having based it on the things we've just talked about, wait until that time. Those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. That's Isaiah chapter 40. I just spend some time with God in prayer. And if you don't have that answer yet, wait for a while. See what God will tell you. See what God will tell you. You rarely get in trouble, rarely get in trouble when you think about a decision rather than just doing it without thinking. You rarely get in trouble. So give yourself some time and, and it will make a difference. Now, having said all that, you've had some time. Okay? <laughs> We've been here, all of us, most of us have been here for several, day, several nights and, after, and, and also Sunday morning. I want you to think about your life. I want you to think about for just a moment where you are. According to the scriptures, where do you stand right now with God? Okay. Are you in the will of God or out of the will of God? In your life, are you in the will of God or out of the will of God? Is there something, and this is my other thought, is there some thing, some activity, some sin that is standing between you and God? And, and I will tell you this. If there is, you know what it is right now. You already know what it is. It's in your head, it's in your heart right now, and you know exactly what it is. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about that? If you're a child of God, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You can deal with that. If you are a person who says, I don't know that I can do it just by myself, Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Ask people here who love you to pray for you. 